We are starting a new series this week. We are done with 1 Peter. We're actually going to be jumping into 2 Peter, uh, possibly within a couple weeks, maybe after the first of the year sometime. Around the first of the year, I do like to go through and talk about what I fully believe is our mission as a church, which has to do with reaching others with the love of God, connecting people to the family of God, equipping believers for the work of God, and also as you go out of this place to go and share the hope and the love of God as we leave. So at some point in the next four months, we're going to probably get into the letter of Second Peter. So if you guys want to jump ahead and read that, go for it. But over the next couple of weeks, what I'd like to do is talk about prayer. And I have, I have titled this series as Prayer Matters. But like I said, you know, we finished up 1 Peter. I enjoyed my study in 1 Peter. And it actually kind of, for me, it, it, it was one of the reasons why I wanted to move towards just this topic of prayer. Because of how important prayer is to us, especially in the midst of living out our life in Christ, what it looks like to suffer and to suffer well. I love that study, like I said, because there are a lot of good topics or a lot of practical topics in 1 Peter that we went through. Very relevant for today's world, I believe. Because Peter set out a framework, right, a theology, how to suffer well as Christians because our identity is in Christ, so we can suffer well. We're his chosen people. It says that in 1 Peter 2. Talks about how our home is in heaven with God. Our time on earth here is borrowed time, if you will. So you and I are to reflect Christ on this earth as we go. Growing in Christ, knowing him more through the sufferings of this world. Like I said, this week, maybe the next couple of weeks, we're going to talk about prayer. That prayer matters. And there's a lot in Scripture about prayer from Genesis all the way to the end in Revelation. There's a whole lot, actually, about prayer. Scripture points to the truth that prayer matters in the life of the believer. And Scripture points to the matters of prayer as well. So I want to read to you a quote by a guy named Ben Jennings that I found to help get our minds jostled a little bit about prayer. And here's the quote. Prayerlessness is an insult to God. Every prayerless day is a statement by a helpless individual, and this is a statement, I don't need God today. Failing to pray reflects idolatry, a trust in substitutes for God. We rely on our money instead of God's provision. We rest on our own flawed thinking rather than on God's perfect wisdom. We take charge of our lives rather than trusting God. Prayerlessness short circuits the workings of God. Neglecting prayer, therefore, is not a weakness. It's a sinful choice. That last line kind of digs the heart a little bit. <laughs> Just let you guys think about that for a minute. Because when I read that, I thought, man, that's a, that's a pretty potent, pretty powerful quote. In Scripture, there are a lot of verses that are very point blank that tell us to pray. 1 Thessalonians 5.17 is probably the most clear, the most poignant verse about telling us to pray, pray. Here's what it says in the New Living Translation, very similar in the rest of them. This is how simple and how clear it is. Ready? Never stop praying. There it is. <laughs> Big long verse right there. Three words this morning. Never stop praying. You can't get a whole lot clearer than that in Scripture. <laughs> Ephesians 6.18 says this. And we're familiar with this. This is the end of the, the, the passage about the armor of God. Paul says this. He says, pray in the Spirit at all times on every occasion. Stay alert. And be persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere. Philippians 4, 6, another letter that Paul writes, he says this, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all that he has done. Luke 18, 1, Jesus 
Now, it says, one, it, it says this in Luke, one day Jesus told his disciples a story to show that they should always pray and never give up. And actually, Luke speaks a whole lot about prayer, too. If you go from Luke beginning to end, there is four or five different parables at least, and there's a few other times where it talks about prayer. And then we also know in John when Jesus gives a high priestly prayer when he prays just before he goes to die on a cross when he's on that, the Mount of Transfiguration. Part of obedience for us is praying. It's pretty simple to say that. Part of intimacy with God is praying. Part of knowing Christ and growing in Christ is praying. How many of us would not spend time or talk with a child, a parent, a best friend, a spouse? How many of us would not talk to them? We would not get to know them. We wouldn't spend time with them. We want, wouldn't that intimate relationship. We would because why? Because we want to know them. Because there's something about that relationship that we think is valuable, important, and it's worth having communication with. And I've said this before, but I believe that we have made the Christian life too overwhelming and too burdensome in the church, and, and also when it comes to God's word. And I think we've done that sometimes when I think about prayer and we talk about prayer. We, we sometimes make it too burdensome and we make it way too overwhelming because we get these rules and it has to look like this, sound like this, feel like, fit like this. And Prayer is not a formula. It's not meant to be a formula as if you and I can manipulate God into acting on our behalf. It's not what it is. Prayer is not, to, not meant to be a last resort either where, you know, we've tried everything else. Okay, now we'll pray. <laughs> so what is Prayer. I believe prayer points towards uh, it being an open dialogue between or with God the Father through Jesus Christ by the power of his Holy Spirit leading us and growing us into mature believers. I'm going to say that again. I believe scripture points to, points us towards that, it's, it's, that prayer is the beginning, it's an open dialogue with God the Father through Jesus Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit leading us and growing us into mature believers. I also believe that prayer, God's word, and the Holy Spirit all go hand in hand. They're united together, never working, never working apart from each other. I want to unpack those two thoughts this morning. The first thought being this. The first thought being that prayer is an open dialogue with God the Father through Jesus Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. Nowhere in Scripture do we really get a definition of prayer, by the way. It's just kind of expected. It's just, it, it's just it, it's what we're, part of what we're supposed to do as believers, part of who we're supposed to be. Throughout the Bible, it's almost just understood that the person who has a relationship with God is going to pray. That communication that I've said a minute ago about, you know, you, if you know somebody, you, you want to get to know them. There's a communication that happens. There's an understanding. There's a learning about them. There's a talking with them. We see exhortations throughout Scripture to pray. We see what is prayed for in Scripture. We're even told how to pray by Jesus during the Sermon on the Mount, but there is really no def definition in Scripture of here's what prayer is. And part of the reason I say it is because over the years I've been asked a lot of questions. What's prayer? I don't. Can you? Where does? Where does? The, what is the definition of prayer in Scripture? There isn't really a definition. It's just an understood thing that we're called to do. Because it's simple. Personally, I think. That, it's, it, it, that it is because what, uh, God wants us to see. Let me back this up a second because I'm going to rephrase this here. In Scripture, we see exhortations to pray, like I said. We see, we see what's prayed for all throughout Scripture. We're even told of how to pray, right? Jesus on the Mount, uh, in the, the uh, Sermon on the Mount. No definition. And I think God doesn't give us a definition because what God wants us to see through scripture is this. 
that it's an intimate relationship with God. It's a personal act of my surrendering to God, and there's quite a bit of freedom in praying to God. Yes, he's holy. We're not. So we don't want to be irreverent in prayer. It's not what I'm saying. But I do know this. He wants and he yearns for an intimate, close relationship with his children that is open and completely honest. I believe that it's meant to be a two-way communication. He knows that as we communicate with him, unity with him begins to take place. Our mind begins to get shaped towards the likeness of Christ when we pray. When you and I come in prayer, the Trinity of God is at work. I don't know if you've ever thought about that before or not. But when we come to prayer, the Trinity of God is at work. God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit, all three one. They're completely, perfectly unified together, never working apart from each other, always acting in accordance with one another. They're God, each with a role. This is a concept that's just way too big for human minds to figure out. I'm not going to dive deep into it because my mind's too small to figure this out for sure. But I know this, that there are truths of faith that we must believe with faith and in faith. And this is definitely one of them when we start talking about the Trinity and who they are, how they interact, and all that. I mean, we, can, we can get deeper into it, but at the end of the day, you've got to come to faith that God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit are one and the same. Distinct persons, different roles, but all God. We're going to look at a few scriptures that spell out, that, that scripture talks about the, the trinity of the Godhead. We're not going to look at all of them because actually there's, there's a boatload. There's a lot of scriptures actually that point towards the trinity. But I want to read some of them. Deuteronomy 6.4, and you'll see where I'm going with this hopefully in a little bit. Deuteronomy 6.4 says this. Hear, Israel, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is One. Well, that's interesting. God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit. My fingers count three. (laughs) But he says the Lord is one. 1 Timothy 2.5, Paul says this. He says, there is one God and there's one mediator who can reconcile God and humanity, the man Jesus Christ. And when he says one God and one mediator, he's actually considering here, he's actually calling God Jesus because Jesus, the mediator, they're one. Matthew 28, 19, familiar verse. Therefore, go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in, you guys tell me, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. We're baptizing him in that. We're not baptizing him in somebody who's lesser. We're baptizing him in God, the Father, God, the Son, God, the Spirit. Each person of the Godhead is distinct, like I said. Hebrews 1, 8, 9 says this, but to the Son... Catch how it says this. But to the Son, God says this. Your throne, O God. So God the Father calls God the Son God. Your throne, O God, endures forever. You will rule with the scepter of justice. You love justice and you hate evil. Therefore, O God, your God has anointed you. Interesting. Pouring out the oil of joy on you more than any, on anyone else. John 14, 16, and 17. And I, Jesus... And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate who will never leave you. He is the Holy Spirit who leads you into all truth. The context, when Jesus said that, by the way, reveals that Jesus is giving the same power of who he is, of God, to them who would be with them and go with them and work through them as Jesus, after Jesus goes to be with the Father. Scripture tells of God the Father raising Jesus from the dead. That's important. Scripture also tells us that God the Son rose himself from the grave. And Scripture also tells us that God the Spirit rose Jesus from the grave. That's interesting when you think about that. They have the ability to raise life. No one has the ability to give life to something dead except for God himself. 
Each person of the Trinity, like I said, has the power of God. Scripture calls each one of them God. We could go through all these verses, and I could, we could go through this for about an hour or so of verses. We're not going to. But what I want to get the point across is that when we pray, the Trinity of God is at work, one and the same, to give us this understanding. God the Father, he's the ultimate source. God the Son, he's the agent through whom the Father functions. And God the Spirit is the means by which the Father does his work. So how does this tie into prayer? Big question here. <laughs> Jesus tells us that we are to pray to the Father, and we can do that because his son, Jesus, made it possible to be able to do that by dying on the cross for our sin. We can now come to God because he's the mediator. He's the one that made it possible for us to come to God, a holy God, as unholy people because we've been washed clean. You and I can cold, come boldly to the throne of our gracious God, as Hebrews talks about. We don't have to fear coming to a holy God because Jesus, like I said, is our mediator. When God looks at us, he sees the righteousness of Christ. That's 2 Corinthians 5.21. That when we come to know Christ, he took, he took our sin and he gave us his righteousness. So when God the Father sees us, his children, he sees the righteousness of Christ upon us so we now can come boldly to the throne of God, to our Father. When God looks at us, like I said, he sees the righteousness of Christ. So what the, where does that leave the Spirit of God in all of this? Romans 8, 26 and 27 says this, and the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. For example, we don't know what God wants us to pray for, but the Holy Spirit prays for us with groanings that cannot be expressed in words. And the Father who knows all hearts knows what the Spirit is saying, for the Spirit pleads for us believers in harmony, keyword there, with God's own will. The Spirit of God prays for us. Isn't that crazy? Goes before us and prays for us. Where we don't can't, where we don't know what to say. And throughout the New Testament, we're to pray in the Spirit. It says that a lot. We're to pray by the Spirit, through the Spirit. That phrase is used a lot. What does that mean? It is the Spirit of God who helps us to know what to pray for, and it is the Spirit of God that matures us in our prayers. As we grow in the knowledge of the Lord, our prayers will begin to be more in line, more and more with the Spirit of God. They will be in harmony, begin to be in harmony more with them, unified. Maybe this will explain it a little more. John 15. Jesus says this, You may ask for anything you want, and it will be granted. Wouldn't that be sweet? Blank check. Here you go, Greg. <laughs> right? There's more to this. And, and, and actually, Jesus says a few different times very similar words, actually, on, during his ministry on earth. Kind of interesting stuff. But what is it that comes before these famous words in John chapter 15 that would give us some understanding of what Jesus meant by when he said, you may ask for anything you want and it will be granted. Let me read them. John 15, 5 to 7 says this. Jesus says, yes, I am the vine. I am the source. You are the branches. Those who, and catch this now, those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. So when we point our eyes when we put ourselves in Christ, when we choose to be in Christ, and all that word abide or remain, same word there, it just means to make dwelling. You're, 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 you're putting yourself, your house, in that place. We're putting ourselves in Christ, in Christ in us. We are intentional in this, of being where he is at, what he is about. So if I remain in him and he remains in me, then fruit comes from my life. For apart from him, you can do nothing. There will be no fruit that comes from your life that is holy, good, honorable before God. Anyone who does not remain in me is thrown away like a useless branch and withers. Such, brand, such branches are they're gathered into a pile to be burned. Catch this part. But if you remain in me and my words remain in you, you may ask for anything you want and it will be granted. Context 
makes it really clear, I think, what this is about, first thing. One chapter before this, Jesus told his disciples this. He says, you can ask for anything in my name and I will do it so that the Son, of, Son can bring glory to the Father. What all those verses that I'm reading about are not talking about perfection, by the way. Don't want to go there. It's not talking about being perfect in Christ and then he's going to, do, he's going to work through us kind of thing. These verses are talking about the motive of our heart. They're talking about intent. They're talking about the direction of the will, our will, over a period of time. And who and what we're connecting our lives to. If you and I, if we are putting ourselves into a place to know the Lord and to grow in the Lord, walking towards obedience in the Lord, didn't say being perfect, but we're trying, we're moving that direction. We're trying to be obedient to what God is asking and wants. We can ask anything in Jesus' name. And that's the key phrase there, is in Jesus' name. To ask something in some you are that person. You are coming representing their heart and mind. Everything about who they are, what they are, what they're about, what they're aiming for, you are coming representing that person. So when Jesus says that you can pray for anything in my name and it will be granted to you, it is speaking of coming to God, asking the same things that Jesus himself would be asking for. That kind of makes it a little more clear about when he says, you can ask anything in my name and I will grant it to you. So how do we know what Jesus' heart is so we can know what to be praying for? And that leads us to the second thought this morning. The second thought that I have is that I believe that prayer... God's word and the Holy Spirit all go hand in hand. They're unified together. They never work apart from each other. Like I said earlier, prayer is an open dialogue with God. It's open communication. It's being honest with God about what is going on in our lives. At the basic meaning of prayer, when you, when you look at it from Old Testament to New Testament, it simply means this, to ask. I mean, you can look at all the different words, and, but you get it all down to it. Basically, just simply is to ask. What are we asking? For anything, but with the understanding that it must fit into and must fit within God's promises within his will. If it does not, he does not act, and that is actually for our good. <laughs> Because there have been things I pray for in my life that, you know, I wish would have been part of his will at the time. And looking back, I'm super glad he didn't answer those things. <laughs> he knows a lot better than I do. God's word is just that. It's his word. John 1, 1, uh, John 1, 1 verse 2 and verse 14 reveals to us that the word of God is completely connected to Jesus. Connected to his heart, connected to his will. Listen to the verses. It's John 1, 1, 2, and 14. Pretty familiar. In the beginning, the word already existed. I'm reading this out of New Living Translation, so it might be a hair bit different than we memorized, but it says the same thing. In the beginning, the word already existed. The word was God. The word was with God, and the word was God. He existed in the beginning with God. Verse 14, so the word, okay, what's the word here? Became human and made his home among us. Ah, so now John is equating the word with Jesus who came and made his home among us, the Messiah. So the word became human and made his home among us. He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness, and we have seen his glory, the glory of the Father's one and only Son. All of Scripture points to Jesus. All of Scripture points to Jesus and the redemption of man. His story, not, not necessarily our story. We just get to be part of it to some degree. But it's his story. For the purpose of bringing glory and honor to God. Scripture is filled with promises. Scripture is filled with promises. And those promises, when we pray according to those promises, they're going to be answered. Because it's, his will, his heart, it's his word. See how they connect. 
All of Scripture, like I said, points to Jesus. One commentator I read said this, and I'm hoping this will help give us a little more depth and a little understanding. Prayer, which is made possible by the gospel, and it's shaped by the gospel, continues to work in the exact same way. And he's talking about from the Old Testament. Because when you follow prayer in the Old Testament to the New Testament, at the basic, it's the same. It's coming to God, it's asking God, it's talking to God, it's bringing our lives before God. And, and when you look at the Old Testament prayers of some of the, 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 the um, fathers of the Old Testament, if you will, their prayers are all very similar. It says, prayer which is made possible by the gospel and shaped by the gospel continues to work in, the exact, in exactly the same way. For Jesus, prayer is basically a matter of asking his father to do what he's already promised. The Lord's prayer in both Matthew and Luke is the template for the new covenant prayer. Talking about in the New Testament, how we pray in the New Testament times. The individual petitions that are made are all requests which dovetail perfectly with the revealed purposes and promises of God earlier in Scripture. The delightful truth is this, that according to Jesus, we do not need to be anxious about asking for the wrong thing. That's interesting. Instead, we are freed, actually, freed up to ask, knowing that our Father will not give us what is unhelpful for us. Nor do we need to try to wring anything of the hands of a reluctant God, where God is contrasted in, in, in Luke. If you look up Luke 18, there's this picture of this parable, which I read at the beginning of it earlier, but there's a parable that, that uh, this um, widow comes to a, a judge, an unjust judge, and he, she just keeps coming to him, just keeps coming, keeps coming to him, asking him over and over again. And that the picture in that is where God is contra contrasted with this unjust judge who needs to be basically beaten into action here. And then she, the, the guy goes on, he says, on the contrary, we can cast all our anxieties on him, God, knowing that through the gospel, God has already committed himself to answering our prayers because they're connected to the promise of the Old Testament and what that would look forward to in the promises of the New Testament. Jesus makes this explicit in this double promise, he calls it, of John. John 14, 13 to 14, when it says this, Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. And then the, the, this guy goes on, he says, The context makes it clear that Jesus is talking about God's revelatory work of opening people's eyes to see the glory of God, salvation, to see who God is. As those who have been invited in to address the Father in the same way as Jesus himself addressed the Father, calling him Abba Father, we are encouraged to pray in line with his mission, his agenda, which is, of course, is to do the work that the Father has given Jesus to do. And then it goes on and says this. It says, we are now encouraged as sons and daughters to ask God to do what he promised. He has promised in and through the Son by praying in the name of Jesus. Throughout the Bible, prayer is always construed as asking God to do what he has promised. Whether it be to send the Messiah and establish his kingdom or to continue to build the church of the Lord Jesus Christ until he returns. Essentially, we should pray for God to do his work through the gospel, which is by his word and through his spirit, through his spirit. The three work together, God's word, our prayers, and, and, and the spirit. God, the Holy Spirit, will never work apart from God's word. I said that earlier. You and I, we are called to grow in the knowledge of God's word. As we grow in God's word and the spirit of God reveals the truth of God's word to us, and brings those truths into our life, maturity in Christ happens. Our hearts begin to reveal and reflect Christ. As the Spirit continues to work in us, as the Spirit grows us into the likeness of Christ, our prayers will begin to mature into the prayers that look like Christ. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? 
It takes time. That takes practice. It's a process of growth. And in that process of growth, God's Spirit helps us by shaping and restraining our prayers before God, before God the Father, when we pray the wrong things. And also shaping and letting our prayers go to God the Father that are the right things. I don't know if you thought about that before. It's kind of interesting. I think that's where Romans 8, 26, and 27 really are going. I think where it's going is, is that, that the Spirit of God is praying, is stepping in our place as immature believers that don't know Christ. We don't have a perfect relationship. We're not fully matured yet. That's where the Spirit of God steps in place and speaks to God the Father on our behalf because we're in weakness. We don't know Christ we're to, to the full depth because if you go to the whole picture of Romans chapter 8, that's the picture of Romans chapter 8. We're weak because we have sin, because we live in a fallen world, because we struggle with sin. But we have the Spirit of God in us who represents Christ, who intercedes on our behalf, who grows us, who matures us, who challenges us. And in our weaknesses, in our weaknesses of even prayer, he goes before us and intercedes and prays the things and speaks to the Father on our behalf where we don't know what to pray or how to pray. I don't know about you guys, there's a lot of freedom in that. It's a true statement that we can come to God, we can ask anything of God. True statement. It is true that we should be honest with God about what is really going on in our life, too, in prayer. We should be honest about things that are going on. We should don't hide things from God. Talk to Him. It's not interesting, actually. If you read the whole, if you read a lot of the Psalms. <laughs> Those are really their prayers. They're, they're points of worship, but they're points of prayer. And prayer, by the way, is very much a form of worship. But when you go through the Psalms, you start seeing like the, the author starts writing, but God, you're great, you know, wonderful, you're majestic, but man, I'm really sick and tired of the nonsense going on in this world. Or is it, when are you going to do something about this? I'm getting frustrated, and it's actually getting to the point where it's starting to tear me down a little bit. But you know what? I'm going to trust in you because you are God, and you know what's best. You see what he does there? He shares his heart and what's going on, but he comes back to the truth of God. What is the truth in that? What am I trying to say? It's that when he does that, the Holy Spirit, Scripture, and prayer are all tied together. But he does share his heart. But again, Scripture and the Holy Spirit go together in prayer. <clears throat> and Scripture goes together in prayer. Prayer is so much more, like I said earlier, than a formula or a pattern. It's a relationship of a holy God who is perfect, who is totally just in everything he does, loving his children and making it possible through Jesus for you and I to crawl up on his lap and talk to him about whatever. With the intent and the hope for his spirit to grow us into his likeness, Christ, the likeness of Christ, as we spend more and more time praying with him. I think that's a mystery, to be honest. <laughs> I think that's part of the mystery of prayer, is how just doing all that stuff, praying to God, coming before him, surrendering our hearts and our mind and will, and he takes all of that, and how we pray, the, the immaturity in our prayers, and as we continue to pray, the Spirit of God works in us and matures us through also the understanding of God's Word so that our prayers and our hearts are unified together with His and there's a maturity that happens through that. It's an absolute mystery to me how that works because that's the Spirit of God working in us and we're just we're showing up and trying... <laughs> It's a mystery because I don't deserve that kind of a relationship, personally. I don't deserve the freedom to come to God. I'm unworthy of the freedom to come to God. And that's why the beauty is that when Jesus gave us his righteousness, we can come to the gracious throne of God, and we can come boldly because we don't have to fear possibly 
dying from God's holiness and my imperfection. I don't have to fear being having to deal with the judgment of an perfectly righteous God when I'm not righteous in any way, shape, or form. I don't have to fear that because I got Christ on me, Christ in me, Christ before me. Only because of and by Jesus can I do that. That is, the, that is true love on his part to give me the freedom to come to him or not even. Prayer is one of the most intimate things that you and I can do with Christ, with God. God's word shapes and teaches us for sure. It's very, it is intimate to get into this because this helps us to understand God, his heart, and who he is. But there's something more intimate, something deeper, something that just, we have to, almost sometimes you feel like you have to jump more hurdles to do sometimes even when we pray. It's one of the most intimate things I believe that we can do with God. And may I dare say this, that it is by prayer that God takes his word and begins to work it in our lives to grow us into a real intimate relationship with God the Father. That's how those things are worked together, prayer and God's word. I'm going to say that again. That by prayer, that God takes his word and begins to work it in our lives to grow us into a real intimate relationship with God the Father. into the kind of relationship that I think is thriving, exciting. It has eyes open to see and to hear the voice of God's Spirit leading us throughout the day. The deeper things of prayer, I think, are, are really a mystery in many times. Right? I mean, some of it, I mean, we could go through a whole list of these. Some of it is, you know, how many of you ever heard the audible voice of God before? Some people say they have. I don't know if, well, that's not true. I know I did once, but it, it was, it was, a fatherly voice that kind of smacked me into shape a little bit. But there have been a lot of other times where I know that God spoke to me. So what did that even seem like, sound like? When I was, a lot of those times it's when I was praying. When I, God, you know, I, what am I supposed to do in this moment? I start praying about stuff and being an ADD type of guy, a squirrel over there took me to a different place in prayer. <laughs> where, and then I realized, oh, sorry, God, I got let me come back to this real quick. And, I, and he's okay with that, by the way, if you guys do that. He understands us. But in that, came back, and then there was just a thought that came into my head in the middle of the prayer. It wasn't an audible voice. It was a thought. It was something that just was all of a sudden there. That's how God speaks to us, I think, a lot of times. Now, so, I do want to say this. I also believe that Satan can do that to us, too. So what we need to do is when it doesn't feel like, doesn't seem like, it does not, it doesn't seem to jive with, <laughs> I'm not so sure about that. Go back to God's word. See what God's word says. God's, God will always confirm. He'll always confirm. If it fits within the boundaries of scripture, all right. <clears throat> the mysteries of prayer, there's a lot of things. Uh, the deeper things of prayer are a mystery. I don't have to know those things to be able to pray, by the way. That's the beautiful part. That's why I just, let's not make prayer too complicated. Let's not make it more than it is. Let's just, let's communicate with our Father. I just pray, and as I pray, I trust, and I ask God to show me more and more of himself and, I, and him working in and through me, what that looks like. And he's going to do it. That's the beautiful part about it. His Spirit's going to work in me. The Spirit's going to speak to the Father in the ways that I don't know how to talk to him about what it is I need, and then the Spirit of God's going to work in me to work through me to grow me into who Christ is so that I can reveal Christ to the world because God's going to fulfill his promise when we ask because now I want to glorify the Father, and so he's going to work through me to do that. He's going to fulfill the promise that he's already laid out, and I can pray that in Jesus' name, and I know that he's going to answer that. So, I just pray, and as I pray, trust, and I ask God to show me more and more of himself and him working in and through me. And because of that, I know he will somehow. I want to read the verse that at the very beginning now, okay? I would like to read this verse, 1 Thessalonians 5.17, and how it's very point blank. Peter's leaving his last thoughts with the Thessalonian people. 
And I think he's leaving them with, or Paul, excuse me, I said Peter. Paul's leaving his last thoughts with us when, after he's written the Thessalonian people, and he, he's writing it to us. Never stop praying. Never stop praying. Never stop praying. It is an attitude of the heart. It's something we do all day long. Don't feel burdened. Don't feel guilt if you're walking along like, oh, shoot, you know what? I didn't pray those last five minutes. That's okay. Move forward. That's the beauty of God's grace. That's the beauty of Jesus before us. We can come back boldly to the throne, the gracious throne of God. Hey, God, I'm back again. <laughs> and just let, let your life, let your, your thoughts, let everything be an open dialogue with God the Father. And I guarantee you something's going to happen in your life. You're going to look back in a year or so from now, and you're going to be like, wow. I feel so much, A, more connected to God. I can look at, I can see maturity in my life, growing in Christ. People are even pointing towards how I'm changing in Christ. And there's something where we begin to understand and feel and know when God is leading us. Never stop praying. Prayer matters. There is a mystery of prayer, but you know what? We, we get to walk in the mystery. We don't have to worry about the mysterious part of it. Let's just go and let's be faithful and be obedient where we've been called to be obedient. Pray where God's heart already is and watch him do some crazy things in your life that are awesome. Watch him move through you and work in you. Watch him mature you into a faithful follower of Christ. I hope that makes some sense. The two thoughts, right? The first thought being that prayer is an open dialogue with God the Father through Christ by the power of the Spirit, because all three are involved in prayer. And the second thought just simply being that prayer, I'm going to get it right here. <clears throat> the second thought being that I believe that prayer, God's Word, and the Holy Spirit all go hand in hand because they're unified together never working apart from each other, because that's, Lord, may we be people that, uh, we have formal times of prayer, we have informal times of prayer, may we be people that our hearts are bowed down before you, may we be people that obey just a simple truth, never stop praying, that is a, that's a, it seems like a daunting task, but God, you are so gracious <laughs> that you, you don't necessarily want it to be a daunting task upon us, but just simply just for us to just, here we are, God, we want to communicate with you, and may your spirit remind us to pray, may your spirit remind us to communicate with you, may your spirit remind us that because we have Christ in us, everywhere we go, Christ with us, the spirit of God is there, the spirit of Christ with us, that we, we can just simply I don't know what to do in this moment. Jesus, help. It's just a simple act of us surrendering and asking you, the creator of this world, for help to the one who has created. Thank you, God, for giving us this tool, if you will, of prayer so that we can have a deeper, more inter intimate relationship with you where we can get to, we can get to know you on a much deeper level, more personal because of your, your spirit in us. In your son's name, amen.